We have to clean the heart. And that's what istighfar is. Istighfar is that, that bathing of the heart, that shower that you regularly take. You know, you feel really dirty if you don't take a shower every day. Istighfar is what cleans your heart. And when you're not doing it regularly, this is repentance. And when you're not doing it regularly, it's like a person who isn't taking a shower. You're gonna become, your heart just becomes dirty because we are naturally sinning, we are, we're human. And just like you get dirt on your body, you get dirt on your heart, so you have to clean it. Okay, I just gave you guys three things. I said the oxygen of the heart, salah. I said the adhkar. I said Quran. And then that was the nourishment and then the cleaning, which is istighfar. Now, I want to, before I close, share with you guys two personal stories of people that I know. And the reason I want to share these stories is because a lot of what we say up here on a podium oftentimes sounds cliche, like, okay, I'll make a good quote, put it on a meme, it's good, right? But I want to just tell you these stories of people that I know who are living today, not in the olden days when you hear all these fairy tales and stuff, right? Today. And they're real people about the power of Iman and the resilience that one can grow from Iman. Okay, the first is a friend of mine I met uh, probably about five, six years ago. Some of you may have heard me speak about her. She, at the time that I met her, told me her story. She said that many years ago she had a daughter and when her daughter was around three years old, her teacher called and said, your daughter just stopped talking. She's, she's not talking anymore and we don't understand what's wrong. So she, you know, that was strange. So she took her to the doctor and eventually the doctor told her that her daughter had a rare genetic disorder called MPS. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with MPS, it is a disorder that has no cure. And what she was told, this mother was told, is that your daughter, who right now is perfectly healthy, is going to slowly lose all of her faculties until she dies as a child. She's gonna lose all her faculties, slowly. You're gonna watch her do that. And there is nothing we can do. There's no cure. So she will lose her ability to do anything. And they said to her, don't expect that she will live past, I think, 13. And then she told me that she had another child, another daughter, and this daughter was tested, and the doctor told her that she also had MPS. And then she had a third daughter, and she also had MPS. And so this woman, had three children, three daughters with MPS. Every single one of them, she was gonna have to watch them slowly die. Literally lose the ability even to swallow. To swallow, do you know, you know our ability to swallow, this is something that I never, I was never thankful for it because I never even realized it. That the ability, that your ability to swallow your saliva is a nama. It's a blessing. Because these, when you can't swallow your saliva, you choke on it. It goes in your lungs. She was actually having to suction them because they couldn't swallow their own saliva properly. So it was making them choke. Then she had a fourth child with severe autism. Now, why do I tell this story? It isn't to tell you, you know, that this is a really, really hard situation and then just leave. The reason I tell this story, and, I, and I'm just gonna tell you that I have, I've been to her home, I've witnessed uh, how she lives. Uh, basically her children, her daughters grew into their teens. And by the time I met her, the three daughters were, uh, I think they were all teenagers and they were all completely bedridden. She had, she, they were on machines. She literally like didn't sleep. She was uh, constantly caring for them. Like her home was like a hospital. There was a section that was like a hospital. 
I also, um, recently, she lost two of them. One of them lived until she was 19. For 19 some years, she took care of this child and, and her other daughter. And, and now uh, one of her daughters is still alive. May Allah make it easy for them. And the reason I tell this story is because of who this woman is. I just, if I brought her here today, you, you would say she was the most, She's always smiling, subhanAllah. But the thing that really hit me is that one day she said to me, I'm drowning in gratitude. That's a, that's a direct quote. Now what amazed me is that she has a trial in her life that I couldn't even wrap my mind around. And yet she has this trial and she's saying she's drowning in gratitude. And to me that's a sign of God that the power of Iman to allow a person to not just withstand a little bit of rain, a little bit of snow, but a tsunami, and to not be broken by it, to not be destroyed by it, to the extent that you can actually show gratitude. And one of the things that she always says to me is that she always looks at those who have less than her. She says she's always, the thing about her is that she's always worried about the people who are suffering somewhere else worse than her. She doesn't look at her situation and say, why me? But she actually shows gratitude because she looks at those who have less than her. When she first got the diagnosis, there was something really powerful that shook me. And that is that her husband says to her, when he was looking at his three daughters after hearing this diagnosis, and you can imagine what that feels like as a father or as a mother. He looked at his three daughters and he says, I feel like I'm looking at three graves. And she said, no, there are three doors to Jannah. I want to tell you this because these aren't cliches, I promise you. These are real life. These are people live, living their real life. And she recognized that this was her door to Jen. But that's what happens to a heart when it is healthy. It is a completely different heart. And it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean you have to be a prophet or you have to be perfect. No, a regular person who takes care of their heart just as it is prescribed can become like that by the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm going to end with this story. Um, so about 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, I used to teach at a school in Wisconsin an Islamic school. And I had a principal at that time, one of the best principals I've ever known, an older gentleman from Thailand. And um, after like a year or two there, he moved. And fast forward a decade later, so this was just recently, a few months ago, I was speaking in a community and lo and behold, he was living in that community and he was the principal of that school. So I basically reunited with my old principal after a decade. And he was, he's, he's older now, so he, he actually just retired this year. But what I found out when I reunited with, with, with Dr. Jitmud is that over the last, that decade of time, a few things had happened. One, his wife had gotten ill with, with cancer and passed away. May Allah have mercy on her. The other thing that I found out is that his son, he was, I think, about 21. He was delivering pizzas, and while he was delivering pizzas, a man slaughtered him, just cut his neck, just like that. And Dr. Jatmud is telling me that he gets a call at 3 o'clock in the morning saying, your son is no longer. He's, he's past tense. He's, he's passed away. He's been, he's been killed. And now, for me, 
I wanted to ask him, how did you cope with that? I mean, that's next level. And he told me that, you know, he was trying to process it. And he said he was just kind of pacing and saying, inna lillahi wa inna lahi raji'oon, and trying to process the shock. But what really, really stood out to me was this. He told me that shortly after that, he asked the lawyers to meet with the killer. So I was like, okay, why? They said, you can't. They told him you can't. You can't meet with the killer because he's in maximum security. And he spent two years just trying to meet with him. And I asked him, why? Why are you trying to meet with him? And he said, he said, I want to meet with him because I want to forgive him. And I want him to be in the same place with my son. This isn't a story about a prophet. This isn't a story about one of the companions. This is, these are people on Facebook. And these are real. And, and some of you may have actually, if you Google it, you can find. Because what happened is, recently, a few weeks ago, the trial happened. And he finally got to meet the killer. And it's on video, him hugging the killer. And forgiving him on behalf. And some of you may have seen it. Forgiving the killer on behalf of his late wife and himself. And I'm telling you that it's real. The power of a healthy heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the healthy heart an ability that's amazing. But that heart has to be taken care of.